truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Hey, folks. So we started this podcast originally because I got to have a lot of interesting conversations on the Hill, uh, whether with uh, witnesses at hearings or just meetings. And I thought, you know, why why not find a way to actually transcribe that and and, and give it to the audience, give it to the people? And that's what this podcast became. Um, and this is one such uh, example of that, where we had a hearing last week on the Energy and Commerce Committee on energy security. And we were uh, blessed to have an Undersecretary of Energy there uh, with us, Paul DeBar. And um, what really caught my my eye, my lonely single eye, about him was not just the energy security aspect in his work at DOE, uh, but what he does now in quantum computing. And um, I thought that was really cool and, and said, you know what, let's, um, let's actually have a, a more in-depth, maybe even a nerdy conversation on quantum mechanics, quantum computing, quantum theory, and the enigma that is the particle wave duality uh, of 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 uh, quantum physics. So, Paul, thanks for being on. Uh, uh, great to be talking with you again, sir. Hey, um, I want to read a little bit about you first uh, for the audience, just to give them a, a more formal setting here of who you are. So, you're currently the chairman and CEO of Bohr Quantum Technologies, uh, developing deploying technologies for the emerging quantum internet. Uh, we're going to figure out what that means. You were, uh, before that, of course, the Department of Energy's fourth undersecretary for science, where you served from 2017 to 2021. Um, you did energy research, energy technology, science, and commercialization of technologies. Uh, before that, you were at J.P. Morgan as, Morgan as a managing director. Before that, you were in the U.S. Navy, right, as a submarine I, officer? I was. I got to eat cheeseburgers, however, uh, for every meal that I wanted. <laughs> that is the... Uh, that is the not so well kept secret of the Navy is that the best food is on submarines. <laughs> I, I suppose that's just the, the morale boost you need to be underwater literally all the time. <laughs> so thank you for your service. It's great to hey, great to be talking to you again. Um, so I, I want to talk about energy security, which was the the uh, title of that hearing um, to the extent that we can. But I really want to get into some of this stuff about your your company. Is this a new company or was this something you'd always been working on? Yeah, so uh, so uh, our our company is a spin out of Caltech. It spun out two years ago. Started that with some co-founders when I left government service, and uh, it's based on a lot of good work at uh, Caltech and some other uh, places. Uh, the the actual um, entanglement and quantum teleportation won the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, this last year, uh, in part uh, due to some. Uh, enterprising and uh, spearheading work done at Lawrence Berkeley and Lawrence Livermore National Labs about 20 plus years ago. That's pretty wild. So I, since you brought it up, we'll just we'll just get into that. Um, what what is quantum teleportation and quantum entanglement? And, yeah. and like from from theory to practice, I mean, that's yeah. that's the real question here. Yeah, so um, the two, two kind of core areas of quantum mechanics, superposition and entanglement is the kind of the core physics that uh, that allows quantum computing to actually work or or networking. Um, and so the, the basics of uh, the basics of uh, superposition is that uh, is that basically particles can be in more than one place at the same time. Another way of thinking about it is. Particles aren't really particles, but they're wave functions. And so whenever you look at a wave function, you take a snapshot, it looks like a particle. And that's kind of the core part of, uh, of superposition that was developed by Bohr, uh, by Niels Bohr about 100 years ago. Um, and entanglement is that you could take two particles at a distance and you could effectively merge them so that the information in one particle and another particle at a distance, either short or, or longer, um, that the information between the two can be entangled. And, and, and effectively, the information is, is instantaneously the same. And so um, you could use that instead of transistors. So instead of ones and zeros, you could use this to basically build chips. 
potentially significantly more powerful chips called quantum processing units for CPUs rather than, uh, sorry, uh, QPUs rather than CPUs, uh, you know, central processing units that are you know, the basis of our computers. So, yeah, in basis of current computers made up of, I guess, trillions, I don't know, billions of these bits that are either a zero or a one. And the combination thereof means something to the computer. Um, how that works, I, I don't even know. And I was going to ask, okay, well, how does a quantum, like physically, how does a quantum computer know? Or, or, or how, how does that work? But I don't even know how a regular computer works. So I'm not even sure where to start on that question. But but in layman's terms, again, it's it's zero or one. And so that's limiting, right? You have you have one of two options. And and to the extent that you can just add many, many more bits, you can increase your computing power. That I got the basics right here. Yeah. So yeah. the idea with a qubit is that there's many states, not just zero and one. And be, and, and those many states come from the fact that in, in quantum theory, it there is a superposition for any given particle, meaning it's a, it can be in different states. So um, I, I can't remember how many states there are, but there's spins, right? There's there's upspin, downspin. Um, these these are referring to characteristics of that particle at any given time. Charge, positive, negative. I think right too. So, does that mean there's just a handful of different um, states it can be in, or is it infinite because the, of the fact that it's a wave function, and therefore you can pick any point that it is on that wave? Yeah, it's exactly the latter part of what you just said. So since it's a wave function, it literally has an infinite amount of combinations of states. Another way that people uh, kind of draw this out is that imagine you have a, a sphere and the top of the sphere is a one and the bottom of the sphere is a zero. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you could uh, show a piece of information by a vector coming out of the center of the sphere. So if it is, it's pretty easy to, to visualize that. So the way, I, the way you can describe that is how many different vectors can you draw from the center of a sphere to the outside? Um, okay. And that's literally infinite. Um, so, so do you even need more than, I mean, that's, it kind of blows your mind then, it, it, that, that amount of processing power. And I guess my, my next question is, what does the hardware even look like? To, to get control over this this quantum state, um, which is a whole weird thing anyway, because you can't know what the quantum state is until you physically measure it, look at it, which gets to a whole other spooky part, what Einstein called the spooky part of quantum physics. It's the Schrodinger's cat, like, I guess, thought experiment where this cat is both dead and alive because of the fact that this, you know, the, the, this, this radioactive part in this, in this particular thought experiment, the radioactive particle is 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 in two positions at once which therefore triggers this poisonous gas if it's in one position but since it's in two positions at once the cat is both alive and dead until you look at it it's just it just gets really weird and so how does that i, I and i'm sorry when people don't realize what i'm talking about that is getting a little nerdy and, and I'm, I'm going over that very quickly how does that work from the hardware perspective yeah so so you know so back to digital right now you have a little transistor and you got billions of them on a chip um, they're either, it's either on or off with a little electrical charge and that we, we, we characterize the on or off as ones and zeros. And you try to make them move as fast as possible. And those combinations of ones and zeros, you know, are attributed to, you know, a pixel of color or a number or things like that. So from a quantum point of view, uh, you do these entanglements of these qubits. Qubits can be a number of different types of matters including even not matter but it could be a, an electron it could be an ion it could be a photon so you could use any of these you know multiple different types of particles um to to program this wave function program that vector uh, in, in, uh into that and when you entangle uh, or basically merge or link uh, two qubits that are next to each other um, you have, uh, you know, it's basically similar to the one or zero, except once again, you can do a, a heck of a lot more than ones or zero. So you can punch a lot more data into each one of those uh, kind of uh, da data points and calculations. And so let me give you uh, a, 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 a truly uh, uh, amazing, uh, but it, not anytime soon, but this is kind of the aspirational power of this. So um, right now, the top-end supercomputer that the U.S. owns in the world, uh, the U.S. has it. It's called Frontier 
uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab, one of the labs I used to run, um, their, their calculations do three times 10 to the 18th calculations per second. And that's such a big number. It's really hard to kind of, kind of, you know, put your head around it. Just as a real, you know, the only number that I like to try to compare that to, to, to get a gauge is that the number of seconds since the big bang was 0.6 times 10 to the 18th seconds since the big bang. So, uh, so uh, every second, the supercomputer that we've deployed at Oak Ridge does five times as many calculations as there has been seconds since the Big Bang, and they do that every second. It's a it's a truly stunningly large number. Um, if you could have a uh, hundred qubits on a, of a chip uh, with zero error rate, and this that's a, a gigantic. Uh, jump that we have not achieved yet. Um, but if you had zero error rate, 100 what's called logical qubits or perfect qubits on a chip, um, the, the theoretical calculation rate would be 10 to the 35th calculations per second. Wow. So that would be 10 to the 17th supercomputers that we have top end supercomputer in the world. Um, and the supercomputer you just talked about at the National Lab, I mean, what does that mean? That's not a quantum computer. That's a that's a classical computer that's really big. Like what what's what makes it so special? Yeah. So uh it um so the top end supercomputers um that have been, you know, once again spearheaded by America, right? Spearheaded at national labs uh, at DOE. Um, one after another tends to be built. It's almost always in the US in terms of the number one. Sometimes it's in Japan, there were a couple of other places. China did jump us, but we 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 reasserted our leadership in the last uh, few years. Um, and uh, they're a combination of CPUs, uh, which are the traditional chips that are in most of our computers, and graphics processing units, GPUs, which actually was built by NVIDIA and some others for uh, uh, for video games. They were, they, they were image. And so we figured out a long time ago that we can make a supercomputer with two different types of chips, some of which are looking at, at 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 visuals, which is really good for like AI or you know national security for like images. Very good for like you know for national security, and some and some of the some of the you know computers made up of traditional data chips. And uh, when a problem comes in, whether it's a national security you know issue or a science issue, basically the software separates out the problem, pro- processes it. Some in the CPU chain, some of it in the GPU chain, re reintegrate it. Uh, we did this for COVID vaccine discovery when we figured out how to, you know, w- which were most likely the best therapies and vaccines. So that's how t- current supercomputers work. We invented that uh, at the DOE National Labs and worked with our partners at IBM and Hewlett Packard and Intel and so on um, on uh, AMD and NVIDIA on building, designing those, and ultimately deploying them. Um, I think there's a really decent chance that a first quantum computer will look something like that, meaning that they'll, it will be a supercomputer with some CPUs, some GPUs, and some QPUs, or quantum processing units. So instead of it being just a pure play quantum computer, there's a really decent chance that it would just be another part of what's called heterogeneous architecture. Hmm. What Going back to the Again, the hardware aspect of a of a qubit and, and a and a quantum chip. Um, so, I mean, what, what you said is pretty amazing. That if if we were able to, to overcome some of these obstacles, you you basically have more processing power on the on whatever on the tip of your finger. I mean, in a tiny one hundred qubits, I'm assuming that's basically microscopic. Um, then then you, this entire supercomputer. What um what are the obstacles to getting there right now? Um, you said a you said a, a zero error rate, and I, I don't know what that means. Just not being a computer science guy, and also you said something else that the that the two bits had to be entangled. What why why did two different bits have to be entangled um, for for this to work? What's the theory behind that? Yeah, so on that and that on that latter question, in order for a current computer to work, you have to have an interaction of one transistor to another transistor. So you have a series of ones or zeros and it means something. Okay. Right? And so entanglement is very similar to that, which is, hey, that 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 quote quantum transistor or the qubit needs to interact with the next one 
to start building chains of information. So very similar concept. Now the physics is radically different, uh, but but the concepts are the same. You need to have kind of chains and interaction of the transistors or in quantum state qubits, you know, bits. They're still bits, they're just with a Q in front of it, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And so you need to you need to do that. Um, and then uh, what's 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 a real challenge around quantum uh, is not the only one, but a big one is is error rate. Now, so if you think about it, if you look down on your table and you got a bunch of wood on your table in front of you, um, the little atoms that are literally right in front of you are getting bombarded and uh, with all sorts of information from the photons of light, from your lamp, the heat, the wind. And so whatever is, was happening, that little tiny atom of wood there, so to speak, in front of you is getting significant amount of errors, meaning it's just the environment is disrupting how the spin of that little atom is. You don't notice it, the desk is still fine, but uh, you need you need zero error rates, right, for these qubits so that when you, when you program information into the, into the spin, right, Dan, as you were saying earlier, you, know, you want it to like not change. And so, uh, and and in natural state, it changes massively. It's it's horrendous in terms of the disruptions right. of that little atom. So the way that we're you know doing it is effectively freezing the little atoms, right? <laughs> and in cryogenics that are millikelvin above zero. I mean, like incredibly. Fro- basically, you just freeze the little atom, freeze the qubit. So when you program the information into it it doesn't get disrupted. So you shield it, you freeze it, and then hope, and hopefully the error rates are, you know, are, are being driven down. Um, 100 cu- In order to get 100 qubits of zero error rate right now, you have to have lots of qubits to fix the error rate of the qubit next to it, so to speak. So people are targeting a million qubits to, you know, to come up with, uh, or more to come up with 100 logical qubits or the equivalent of zero. So the first quantum computers are going to be extremely large because most of it's going to be there to uh, screen out uh, the error rates. Interesting. And what, how do you, how do you, I mean, we might get, just let me know when we get into too much details that just doesn't even make sense for a podcast, but how do you even program it? Like you, you kind of pointed at it, like you're, like you're sticking it with something. How the heck do you program it? Are you shooting it with an, an electron or photon. I mean, it, it, it just yeah. dealing in that in that in that world in that microscopic world in that quantum world is very difficult. I I personally don't understand how it works. Yeah. So to to program spin into an atom or one of the other qubit types, in general, you either use lasers or microwaves, and so you can program. You know, because you're basically putting information into a spin. You can control the spin with lasers, which is really just photons. Mm-hmm. Um, or microwaves. Uh, so that's that's in general how uh, people program these uh, qubits. Um, another random physics question. Do you? I've heard um, some lecture on this, and they'll actually ascertain that there's no such thing as a particle. That it's really just um, uh, what, what you're seeing when you measure a particle is really you're you're, you're you're, you're seeing um, a variation in a field, in a quantum field, whether it's an electromagnetic field, a quantum field, a Higgs field, whatever it is, that's what you're actually seeing, which gets really weird when you're talking about matter and what the heck we're made of, because you're talking about <laughs> us when you're talking about particles. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, that was a big um, kind of argument that, that Bohr and Schrodinger and Heisenberg uh, and that kind of arm of physics uh, that was somewhat distinct from how Einstein thought about relativity, that uh, that that particles don't really exist. We're, they're all wave functions. And this is the way, if, if, if everything's a wave function, if every atom is a, is a wave function or a particle is a wave function, uh, you're in a probability zone. And actually, all of us, when we studied chemistry in middle school, you learned about these kind of clouds for electrons, right? The, ori- the original the original um, model of the atom that uh, that people probably learned in school was the Rutherford atom, which was electrons kind of circle like like planets. Mm-hmm. But s- soon after that, they figured out that it really wasn't that way, and electrons were actually in probability zones, which is just another way of saying a wave. It's a wave, rather. It's a, you know, it's a, it's in a cloud. Mm-hmm. It's not really in one place. And so um, there was great 
history and physics that even though Einstein came up, started coming up with this, he immediately really disliked it and started lobbying against the idea. So Einstein and Bohr uh, and Bohr's crowd, uh, like Heisenberg and Schrodinger, actually were very much uh, uh, argumentative back and forth with Einstein, uh, uh, you know, back back 100 years ago. Yeah, what's crazy about the history of uh, of quantum physics is how long ago it was, first of all. So they had no tools or instruments to really um, verify what they were basically, the conclusions they were coming to based on the math. This is so interesting about, I don't know, it gets to a general question about nature and truth and and how how the language of mathematics literally led them to this truth that is old that was ultimately discoverable with our modern technology right. um and only recently and you said this before how recently it was a nobel prize um uh when we managed to entangle two photons i think and and, and prove that uh, actually, I, I forget exactly what they used but but you you can use photons but you could use a number of ones i, I forget what they exactly used at berkeley uh, for and how long ago was that it wasn't that long ago. It was in the seventies, I think, if I remember. Oh, I mean, really? they were. I mean, like a lot of things in science, right? And and what you fund, and you know what Congress funds is, you know, one of the great strengths of America is discovery and, and you know and idea generation that are somewhat crazy. Most of the people who invent things are are not conventional. Um, they, you know, they, they're the ones who come up with a kind of out out of box idea. Uh, and then they get a little bit of money, uh, in that case from DOE. Um, and they did some experiment that most people thought they were literally crazy. And, you know, sometimes they are crazy and sometimes it doesn't work. But periodically, you know, one of these kind of crazy ideas, uh, you know, actually, actually happens. And, um, and that's what this team did. They, they, they were very much off, the, off the normal radar screen, but DOE back then funded them and, um, they decided to do this experiment. That was theorized by Bohr and, and Schrodinger. Um, there's another theorist by the name of Bell figured out the, 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 the concept of how to go do it. And this crowd actually went and physically, like they did the experiment and they proved it was right. The theories, the mind, the mind theories um, were, were accurate. Yeah. And that, that basis of that, you know, small amount, I don't know how much money they got, probably like a hundred thousand dollars. It was probably wasn't a lot of money. Um, and they, uh, they were able to prove this. And this is, this is the, you know, a major trigger point of, as you said, turning theory of Bohr and Schrodinger into real experiments into a new industry today. Yeah, it, it's wild. I mean, the, the, the theory of entanglement in itself is wild. This idea so that the two photons interact in some way, they become entangled, separate, um, in a controlled environment and, you once you measure one it automatically affects the state of the other instantaneously so that, 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 that that's probably that's another reason einstein didn't like it very much because einstein liked the speed of light he came yeah. up with that you know it's e equals mc squared it's kind of important um this this defies that particular law of physics which yeah is, i mean the, the, the way the way i so just to talk about quantum networking and try to put it into kind of how people can kind of visualize it it actually it's horribly similar to active sonar on the submarine. Hmm. Um, you had to bring so, it to submarines. So, yeah, yeah, I, 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 well, you know, I got my I got my North Pole thing behind me at the moment. When I was, <laughs> we we surfaced at, at Pole uh, way back when. Yeah, cool. um, so uh, so the way you can think about entanglement is imagine two tennis balls, and those are particles, right? But you think about tennis balls, and they're coming together, and they imagine they hit each other, and they bounce off, and that exact instant, right? A T zero that they hit each other. Um, they basically bounce off each other, and you could think of the angle and the speed of the two tennis balls are exactly 180 degrees out of phase. Mm -hmm. That you know that micro microsecond, right? Nanosecond that they they hit each other, and then they bounce off each other, and then the wind's blowing and whatnot, and all of a sudden they're no longer entangled they're no longer exactly equal to each other in terms of information which is you know angle and speed and what and so you can think about that as an entanglement right those tennis balls are entangled for that fraction of a second until error rates errors start adding into it so now think about the tennis balls at a distance how can you entangle two tennis balls or two you know two two ions right two two qubits at a distance 
And so what we do uh, in, in the experiment that, that won the Nobel Prize and what, we, what we're doing for commercializing quantum teleportation is we want to try to, quote, link these two tennis balls, these two qubits. And the way that we do it is we shoot a photon from one tennis ball, one qubit, to the other qubit, hit it. That's the active sonar analogy that I like to use for a summary. So we ping mm -hmm. the other qubit at a distance. And then we do something called a bell state measurement, which allows for that information to be merged between the two of two of it. And um, and that's one entanglement evolution. And the way that you do uh, quantum teleportation networking is that you shoot a series of photons. Each photon is one bit of information or a qubit in the quantum, but you think about it as a bit of information. Mm -hmm. And so you generate a photon, you have a, you have a piece of information in that qubit, you shoot the photon. So it is limited by the speed of light in the way that we're doing it, because we have to shoot something to do that connection at a distance. They do the measurement and then it instantaneously uh, gets moved effectively through the merging of the data. It's not faster than the speed of light because you still got to send a photon from here to there. So that's the speed of light. But once you do that networking, so to speak, that Bell State measurement, the, in the information constantly go uh, in instantly goes. So you're just sending a whole stream of photons and each one is one bit of information. You're doing a whole series of you know, you could be doing, uh, you know, a gigahertz, right? You could be doing a billion photons in a second. And, and as long as you got a system that can detect it, do the Bell State measurement a, bill, a billion times a second, uh, you have a billion pieces of quantum bits being transferred from here to there effectively. And it's called, we're calling it transportation, but is it, is, are we just talking about communication? I mean, is, is this yeah, yeah, yeah. encryption too? Is it encrypted uh, as a result or is that a different... <laughs> Technology. Yeah, so there's a lot of interesting use cases. We were talking about quantum computers and how do you how do you scale quantum computers um, and uh, and and any sort of quantum data, which there's other uses for quantum data besides computers. But yeah, there's a whole security aspect to that, and one of them there's a couple of them. One is something called um, uh, uh, um, I'm just kind of mind dumping right here. Uh, you could. Uh, this is this is public. <laughs> okay, securities agencies. Uh, oh, sorry, this is called a routing error. Sorry, I just forgot. So, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, and this is this is not classified. You can find this anywhere on the internet. Um, uh, the way people steal information, uh, whether it's a government or a non-government, uh, many times they they copy the information that's sent from here to there, like like this, like a Zoom. Information goes, uh, you know. The, the, the current internet protocol, um, basically the, this video is sent between where I'm at and where you're at mm -hmm. based on the most efficient way to get from here to there. And there's an instantaneous software system for this information on the Zoom to go from, from your place to my, our place. There's a way for entities to reroute that information and copy it. And whether you're a government or a not for government. And so that's called a routing violation. And uh, I think, as you know, many people may know, uh, you know, your credit card information, um, you know, Zooms, telephone phone calls. If someone has enough resources, they can copy everything that you're doing just by routing it through another server farm that they may have leased through a Bahamas entity and copy it and then de-encrypt it. So that's called a routing violation. That's how a lot of stuff's stolen. Um, uh, because of how quantum works, it can only go from one place to the other place. You're guaranteed that it's not gonna get rerouted. It only can go from one place to the other place. Mm -hmm. The other thing is if someone tries to intercept the information uh, and copy it, whether it's rerouted or not, um, uh, the Bell State measurement is required to de-encrypt that piece of information to create the entanglement. So if someone tries to take any any information, by the way, it could be a digital, right? It could be just a one or a zero. But the physics of, of quantum networking, uh, um, uh, if anyone tries to intercept it, and the Bell State measurement's not made between the two places it's supposed to come from and go to, 
um, it will it will it will show up as gibberish effectively. But, uh, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it would show up as light. It's just you're you're, you're collecting light, and and, right. and so and so you know it's it's. It, I guess that yeah, the physics, like you said, are just totally different. It's not like you. It's not like you're um, you're 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 getting on a radio and transmitting, and then anyone can pick up based on a frequency. That that's not it, it, that's not even analogous. It's not even right. at all what we're talking about. You have to have two a receiving station and transmission station that are that are that are designed together. Right. Um, and can only talk to each other. That's right. That's right. And then the other. There's another part of quantum networking, which is also interesting. It's a little bit less high end, but still definitely better than current technology. So right now, as, as everyone knows, there's these RSA keys that are used for encryption for our communication. Um, uh, and those numbers are, are basically random number generators, right? That are those keys that sometimes people have those fobs to, to go do. Um uh, you you could cr- instead of creating a random a digital random number for uh, with the algorithm for RSA keys, you can make a quantum key so that the, the that instead of it being a number, it mm-hmm. could literally be a quantum calculation, which as we were discussing could has a lot more degrees of freedom. Yeah. Um, and so there are entities out there looking uh, who are trying to commercialize already. Uh, instead of there being RSA keys, that there would be uh, a quantum key uh, that would be used for the encryption and the de-encryption of, of normal data. Oh, uh, last question on this before I move on to some more general uh, questions on national labs and science, uh, and physics, and energy. Um, what what do we need supercomputers for? What you know, our, my iPhone seems to work pretty fast. It works faster than I can possibly comprehend then i can can i then i can direct it so what are what are the utilities for supercomputers so uh first you know the probably the most prolific use of of supercomputers at the very high end is uh discovery of innovation topics Hmm. and so let me give you an example um uh in uh the summit supercomputer we had back during the covid time frame um uh they got the, the genomic sequence of COVID-19. They then figured out very quickly through both image and, 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 and CPU data um, that, uh, that COVID-19 was over 90% equal uh, in terms of the genomic sequence to SARS and MERS. And each SARS and MERS, and in this case, COVID-19 proteins, uh, going protein by protein and figuring out what the proteins did and which drugs either that had already been invented, had been looking at for SARS and MERS for use for those proteins and other, on other types of biology that were, you know, that, that are out there. And they chugged through all that and and some more imaging. So they did more imaging at some of the stuff and fed that into the supercomputer in about three weeks, they figured out which drugs about the top 10, which drugs were likely going to be able to go after which proteins and stop it. Hmm. Uh, so in about three weeks, we figured out the very likely uh, drugs and the, the rest of the nine months really was doing phase one, phase two human trials on various of those drugs. And as a result of that supercomputing power, you know, the, the previous all time, you know, fastest record for a vaccine from scratch was four years. And we did it in nine months. And it was primarily because of supercomputing guiding what to go do. Let me give you another quick other example. Uh, the lithium ion battery chemistry took 11 years from the initial lab experiment to this can actually work in a commercial product. Um, someone went back and calculated that if a supercomputer could guide the researchers what to go do in the lab, how to narrow the funnel faster, they could have done the exact same work in three years. Really? Wow. So there's a lot of, of discovery, and we're beginning to see commercialization of supercomputing, kind of AI-driven discovery for chemistry and you know new drugs and stuff. There's some startups doing that now. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's these problems where you have massive amounts of data uh, that require supercomputing to actually crunch it. I've read too that, um, you know, you could, it, I'm not sure that this has a 
utility necessarily. Um, but for creating a for creating a highly realistic simulation, you would need just this massive amounts of computing power. Um, I, I guess I guess whatever we can imagine, we would need you you could do um, with with something like this. Yeah. What um I, I just I had a question as I've, I've been talking to you is how did you even get into all this? Uh, so you went from the Navy to J.P. Morgan. How, how did you get into the to, to being able to pull back quite a few layers on 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 the science behind this and then and then founding a company related to it? Yeah. So when I was in the Navy, I worked in one of the DoD labs for a little bit on computer simulation and modeling on defense uh, topics. Um, so I had a bit of a background in that. I was I was a I was a, I'm a nuclear engineer, nu- say nuclear physics, which is related to a lot of these topics. Uh, so I've been a computer, a bit a bit of nuclear reactor, nuclear physics background. Um, the DOE came from. I did a lot of work for DOE, so I helped um, uh, privatize the enrichment business. Um, I worked for the government of Japan actually on uh, when Fukushima happened on the on uh, having to have to uh, take over Tokyo Electric Power. But I I ended up getting appointed under the Bush administration and then reappointed four times under the Obama administration to one of the main advisory boards of DOE dealing with running of the national labs and and some of the aspects to that. Um, So I knew knew DOE pretty well from my energy work, my contracting work, my advisory board work. Um, Speaking of... um... Uh, the nuclear nuclear physics nuclear side of things. I mean, we, we recently had a really interesting breakthrough on fusion. Uh, talk to us about fusion. What what the obstacles are uh, to fusion, and where, where you see it going? Yeah, so I was lucky to run the fusion energy program for the U.S. Um, and we um, the you know in in general fusion had been quite flat for a very long time in terms of innovation, meaning not not a lot. Um, and, uh, and so people had, had started getting kind of worn down on, it's always 30 years out and next year, it's still 30 years out and the following years is still 30 years out. Uh, but, uh, there was, uh, there was a jump in innovation on a number of different things. One of the main ones was on material science. And so not all the fusion types, but a lot of the fusion types requires very strong magnetic fields to contain the plasma long enough, you know, and hot enough in order to cause fusion and get net energy out. We we know how to do fusion. It's about it's about the efficiency so mm-hmm. that we get more out of it than we put in. That's actually, you know, that's been the challenge. And um and so I'll give an example. Um there was uh a group out of MIT who who came up with high temperature superconductor material. Uh MIT did for just other reasons, but the fusion people said like why don't we use this? Uh, for you know, rather than the old old uh, uh, magnets, you know that we were making, and uh, they were they were able to increase the magnetic field by about like three or three or times. And since the power is squared, mm-hmm. um, it was massively more powerful magnetic field, and um, and and that's why uh, all of a sudden there's been this big jump. Um, and, you know, not only the federal work, but the private sector has raised a a massive amount of money. Um, you know, a lot of people are very excited about clean energy technologies a lot more than a few years ago, a lot more private money. Um, when, when, when I joined a DOE, we embraced the private sector. They were not embraced previously, uh, by DOE. That's a longer conversation, but, um, uh, but we embraced them, and subsequently, I think about five billion dollars were raised in the private sector. And there's a number of companies trying to build, um, you know, commercial fusion plants. Hmm. Already, they're already trying to build the plants. I, is is the, the actual breakthrough of fusion that that far along at this point? Yeah. So if you look at uh, there's a you know you know. It, it, I'm always a bit cautious, you know, uh, venture startup companies are always very positive, but t- take that aside, I've seen some of the science uh, behind it. And I've had a lot of other people, you know, look at the science, you know, and have kind of consensus views. But, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a number of companies, one up in Vancouver, one in Southern California, one in Massachusetts, 
that are uh, that are actually building, you know, first cores, not not the whole power plant but cores to go to go uh, do what I just said. And, um, um, you know, the the, the NIF, uh, uh, the, the Lawrence Livermore, the first time there was a net out fusion um, this this last year that, that got one point five times at the at the laser point to the fuel. Um, uh, I think a, a number of these companies from the quote wall plug to the fusion reaction could be eight to 10 times net out. So quite material to the point that it's commercial grade uh, in terms of energy production. Um, and so we'll see, we'll see if they could do it, the physics of what they're doing. As I said, I've seen lots of people look at it who, you know, head of, head of big labs and they go like, they, they might be able to do this. Hmm. And what, I mean, what would that mean for our energy security going forward? Yeah, I mean, fusion has uh, has all the positives of 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 any of the other uh, you know fuel types, and almost none of the negatives. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, if 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 we could contain a star on Earth, right? Uh, to use a kind of gen- gen- general term of talking about fusion, um, you know, the 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 primary fuel that people are looking at is hydrogen. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of others, but uh, like boron and whatnot. But in general, it's just hydrogen. Um, and uh, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. It's the most abundant element in uh, on Earth um, because it's water. Um, and uh, so uh, so we got we got the abundancy of, of the energy source. Uh, as I like to joke about about one microsecond after the Big Bang, uh, the universe chose its most efficient energy production and it was fusion. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, n- nature's already picked it, right. As its best, uh, you know, best, best one. Um, and uh, uh, you know, as, uh, and then on the um, emission side, it has no emissions. Uh, basically the standard uh, reaction that people are looking at is helium, uh, non-radioactive helium is regular old helium. And that's not going to hurt anybody. Um, uh, and so that's, uh, amazingly good, right. From any sort of either any sort of emission or, or waste that comes out of it is literally just helium. Um, and, um, uh, it's uh, completely in theory, it would be completely dispatchable like a nuclear power plant or a gas plant or a coal plant, you know, wind and solar are great at some things and they're horrible, worst at uh, dispatchability, uh, mm-hmm. and availability. So, uh, it wouldn't have any of those problems that wind and solar has. Um, it's very dense as compared to wind and solar, right? Which is very, very diffuse and hard to cite uh, because of its size uh, of land. Um, it does uh, irradiate the steel around it, but it's what's called low-level radiation, which is very minor uh, and not like nuclear fuel, not not uranium mm. sources. So in uh, in the big scheme of and, and by what it can't blow up, I, I won't get into nuclear weapons, fusion weapons versus a core, but basically a fusion power plant uh, is is not going to blow up. Uh, it's not going to have an incident, um, just the way the physics works. So um, yeah, it would be wonderful if we could get there, and uh, I still think it's a win, um, not you know not an F. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. I mean, it would it would just. It would end all of our conversations about energy <laughs> for, for for forever. Um, this, this argument that we're having, uh, this argument that that you saw underscored by the, by the hearing we had, where you, you you've got a Democrat party that's just they, they cannot see past solar and wind. These are like deities that they that they worship. Um, and you know we're, we're, we we find ourselves always asking the question: Do you, do you hate emissions or do you just hate fossil fuels? And um, you know, they they say emissions, but they mean fossil fuels. They really just don't want any of it. And I, I don't know. I don't know how they get to this point where they're whistling past the graveyard and and, and just believe that everything will, will work out OK. But um, th- that's the argument on 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 one, one question on um, on traditional nuclear fission technology. I don't remember if we talked about it at this at this hearing uh, if it was some other uh, setting, but. You know, one question I've always had is, you know, you're from you're from the nuclear submarine community. We we enrich uranium at a, at a much higher rate on a nuclear submarine. We basically have these small modular reactors on our submarines, and yet we talk about small modular reactors like they're this brand new technology that we 
that we've got to develop. We, we've, we've got to test out. We've got to scale it. And I, I don't who is making these submarine nuclear reactors and who's been doing it for 50, 60 plus years. Yeah. I mean, where, why is this? Why are we acting like this is new? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're made by a company called Babcock and Wilcox near Roanoke, Virginia. And they've been there for you know, a long time. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so we yeah, I mean, the Navy's been building small modular reactors and welding them into submarines and aircraft carriers for a very long time. Um, the biggest issue with, with nuclear is my, you know, it's my home base. I love it. I also, am, uh, you know, am wide eyed about the problems of, of it. The problems with nuclear have been construction problems. And it's, it's uh, anything, not just nuclear, anything big, new and first of a kind whether it's a bridge or uh, an airport or a chemical plant or a nuclear plant, um, unsurprisingly, uh, is 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 uh, is uh, over scheduled and over budget on a regular basis, right? Mm -hmm. Air building airports, you know, there's always problems, and people are always getting mad about you know why is it taking so long and it's way over budget, mm -hmm. right? And so th there's there's just a general problem that when you got lots and lots of rebar and lots and lots of concrete and things that have never been built before. Um, that 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 uh, that those construction projects turn out poorly, and we see we see that at Georgia Power, right, with the Vogel nuclear power plant, and in South Carolina recently. Um, and so the idea is that if you could do it at a factory, and and everything is perfectly you know easy to do because effectively it's small, you put your hands around it, uh, not a lot of scale problems of, you know, once again, a lot of it's civil engineering problems. It's not nuclear problems, it's civil engineering problems. Um, and that if you could do that and make it and make it in a factory and put it in a semi and ship it off to, to Newport News and weld it in, um, th those reactors are on time and on budget on a regular basis uh, for the Navy. This seems and like so, an eminently solvable problem. <laughs> that uh, it just, I Because I mean, it's not like we haven't built these before in mass quantities. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, it, 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 this perplexes everybody. I, I, I know, I know the issues we have on, on that committee that you testified at are we, we hear from Democrats that they're becoming more and more pro nuclear. Um, they, they, they haven't been in the past for whatever reason. Uh, the, the general climate, climate activist community has been very against nuclear, uh, for a long, long time. That's changing slowly, but surely. And, um, but they still won't take any look at the regulations, the, the permitting process, the, the things that add to these um, over, over budget, over, over time period uh, or over scheduling delays, all of it. Um, it's, 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 it's partly that we've kind of lost the expertise in the industry, it seems. And uh, that, that's a, that's a national security problem. That's a, that's an energy problem. It's a lot of, it's a problem for a lot of reasons. Uh, but our, but our regulatory framework just can't seem to catch up, which is frustrating. I, I think it, I, I I think it would be great for your committee to look at that topic and look at some legislation to to ease that. I mean the 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 problem is, and you know I I, I appreciate I I understand why it happens. You have regulatory agencies who get graded upon if they issue a regulation. In part, if they if they issue a regulation that doesn't get overturned in an appeal at a court. And over the course of time, regulatory agencies become more and more conservative because they get judged on whether they get overturned. That, because if they get overturned, that means that their that their review of something was poor, right? right. Some judge decided it, it's poor. They become highly so, risk averse. Yeah, yeah. yeah so they, and they become more and more risk adverse over time. And um, so you know they need a push to um to streamline things because then they can at least point to a law and say well i'm being told to do it this way um and then they have a defense so to speak what uh it, it kind of changing uh, uh directions here but not really uh national labs are are i think one of the gems of american innovation um you know, in the healthcare space, government funds a lot of new science, a lot of, uh, I guess you would call it basic science from from which companies like yours going to jump off of. I, I explain to the audience, if you will, what th that proper relationship looks like. So, so and, and what I'm responding to is the typical more of a left wing argument, which is 
these 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 billion dollar companies, whether it's in healthcare or engineering or whatever it is, make make a lot of money off of science that was paid for, promulgated, researched by government funding. Why do they get to do that? Can you explain that chain of events and, and how that works and why both sort of need each other? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot of basic discovery and whether it's in drug discovery, you know, life sciences or in batteries and chemistry or whatever, uh, um, energy types that are so far away from cash flow and so questionable about whether they will ever, you know, work that, you know, no one, no venture capitalist, no company will, will pay for that. I mean, it's just pie in the sky sort of ideas. A lot of that comes from an individual researcher at a national lab. A lot of it comes from an individual professor, you know, at a university, you know, taking a look at some cancer therapy and it's like some crazy idea on a piece of paper and they pitch it right into uh, a funding from government. Once again, the private sector won't, won't fund it at that point. Um, and you know, they'll get a hundred thousand dollars and they'll go test whatever that is. Um, the vast majority of those things never turn into any, anything that's commercial. A lot of it's pure science and they're just kind of, you know, you know, kind of looking at how cells work and on this or this or that. But every once in a while, I'll stick with the healthcare one. Uh, Jennifer Doudna at Lawrence Berkeley and UC Berkeley thought she could figure out a way how to change the genes consciously in a, in a gene sequence that had just been sequenced in her at her university at her lab, the Human Genome Project. She started basically fiddling with it, not knowing where she was going to go. And lo and behold, she figured out that she could edit genes. And that's caused a giant biotech revolution because you could engineer, you know, individual things um, to cure sickle cell anemia, right? We've, we've cured, we've cured a major genetic disease um, because, because of that technology. She, she, no biotech company would have funded her back then. It was, she didn't even know where she was going, frankly, at the very, very beginning. And uh, and she ended up with an amazing discovery and, and a Nobel Prize in a whole industry. And so uh, I, I, I now I'm going to say an opinion. You know, the best case for 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 federal money is where the private sector isn't. And uh, and where the private sector isn't is discovery science and whatever topic it is, mm -hmm. because the private sector won't fund that. And so uh, one of the great strengths of America is that there's a lot of hundred thousand dollar projects from NIH or DOE or the National Science Foundation or, or, or DOD, even DOD funds a lot of research at universities yeah. and elsewhere. And so every once in a while, something comes out of it. But even when it comes out of it, it has to be commercialized. And believe me, the professor who got you know the money from NIH or from Caltech or you know UT or whatever, um, and because some of it is not federal money. I mean, there's a lot of university only money that goes into this stuff too. And I think usually most discovery is a mix, right? Of, and some foundations, some some people just donate money, right? Especially in life sciences, right? Lots of donations go into life, life sciences. So there, those are those are purely private, you know, investments, right? On the not for profit side. And every once in a while, something comes out of it, and then you know, some entrepreneur actually has to turn that into like a product. Um, and so, you know, the system works very well. I would argue, and I know this is, you know, more of a partisan point nowadays, but I, I, I think I agree with you if I understand you and certainly the Republican caucus, which is, you know, putting money into uh, deployment of technologies, the private sector has plenty of money to go invest in, is not usually the best place for the federal tax, you know, the taxpayer money. And, um, and so, you know, that, that debate kind of constantly is had, but what's been as of late, you know, I think a lot of what we did when I was still, when I was in government here recently, we, I know we advocated for discovery, the stuff that, you know, once again, the private sector isn't doing that makes a giant difference and it's high risk because no one really knows which ones are going to work. And but more more recently, some of these recent bills have been let's put the federal taxpayer money also into or focus it more into deployment of things that have already been proven. Um, and that's a philosophical argument. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I've actually never put it that way. I mean, you might make that point about the CHIPS Act 
Um, and you know, that, that one, the, the Republicans voted against that for a lot of different reasons. One, the politics got toxic. It got, I won't get into it. And frankly, I don't even remember exactly what, what happened, but the politics got toxic on based on other bills and, and promises about reconciliation, things like that. So that was one thing. The, the top line increased drastically from this like $30 billion bill to this God knows what, um, and and then and you know through conversations with industry it became unclear that they really needed it that they weren't going to do it anyway that it really mattered now to a certain extent it did i mean a lot of them were literally just looking at offers from france japan whoever it was and saying well they're offering 10 billion they're offering 12 billion are you guys going to offer 13 billion because if you don't i'm just not going to take it and that's a just that's just a crappy bidding war for the U.S. government to be in, first of all. So I don't like that. Um, and also, th then I had to ask myself, does it really matter if it's in France? It matters if it's in China or Taiwan. That matters to me. I'm yeah. not sure it matters to me if it's in France or Japan. There's no signs of them ever not being allies. So, you know, it, it, and so it, it became more and more difficult to to vote for. And also, when you looked at what we expected from it, if it all went swimmingly. Was like a was like an increase. I don't know. It was a very low number increase in what domestic manufacturing would become. And then talking to guys like you, you're like, are we even going to be using these kind of chips in the future? Or, or, or is or is are we better off investing in something where we can leapfrog the next leapfrog the next technology? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, I I luckily had did not have to deal with reconciliation and all the other riders on the Chips Act, which I know became quite numerous, but uh, the core part of the the Chips Act was actually an authorization bill um, for the sciences, and I, I was in support of that. Uh, it and, was, yeah. How science even voted 100%, right? Both sides, when they originally right. vo voted I that. I forgot out about that. It was, it was, it was, it was authorizing, again, just ongoing programs just for the yeah. audience. What, what he means by that is, it was authorizing ongoing programs um, and, and attaching that, I think, to get more people to vote for it, uh, which is what they'll do. But yeah. 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 So, you know, a, a lot of the CHIPS Act, uh, the, the largest amount of it was authorization, not not appropriations. And it was it was for NASA. Right. It was for DOE National Labs. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, a jump to try to get us to the moon and Mars and stuff like that and about 20 ish percent but fully appropriated was the the fab semiconductor fab mm -hmm. support and they and they crammed them all together right during you know some point in time during that drafting um yeah and, and I, I could be proven wrong it, it may end up being just a this, this great net benefit i mean we could spend money on worse things and we certainly do uh just as, as a general rule uh, I told you about an hour, so we're 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 already we've already blown past that. But I I can't help but ask because it's in the news constantly. Which and you're a science guy, um, you're you're a smart man. You, you've seen the 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 edge of the frontier as it as it pertains to technology and technological advances, and we have these unidentified aerial phenomenon uh, percolating throughout our skies in the last few days. Um, do you have any do you have any thoughts on this? I'm not even sure that I have any thoughts, so I won't I don't, don't feel bad if uh if if you don't, but I'm I'm just curious what your take is and and what the origin type of aircraft this is. It it, it seems like we legitimately don't know at this point. So, uh, at at a big picture, one of the things that surprised me in 2017 when I showed up after I was con confirmed and showed up and I started getting briefing on how much the Chinese were stealing from us in terms of technology. Mm -hmm. And it was stunning. And, you know, for a while, um, you know, I was just pummeled with one giant stealing problem after another. And it was, it was so big. Like my initial reaction was, I don't know what we can do about it because the problem is so damn big. And I was stunned by that. And I'd sit down with Secretary Perry and Briette and, and I would go like, you know, and after a little while of absorbing it and like every briefing every day, something new going on where the Chinese had penetrated, you know, by hiring people at national labs. We had Chinese, you know, employees working in national labs. And, um, you know, maybe I'm more of a Navy guy than a DC guy, but, you know, uh, you know, 
the problem was my problem, right? Because I was sitting in the chair and it wasn't about hiding it. It was about addressing it and calling it out uh, rather, in, which isn't very DC. Um, but, but it was, as you, as you know, sir, it's very Navy. Um, yeah. it, and, and and then we, I, we kind of reached the psychological point of, okay, we, we can't solve everything, but let's start, let's start putting holes in the dikes. Let's start, let's start, start stopping things that were so ludicrous and we could, we could move the ball down the field. We know that we weren't going to solve every Chinese stealing problem, but let's try to make as much of a difference as possible. And so the first order that we issued was that if you worked at, at DOE and national labs, that A, you had to disclose if you were working for someone else. I know that seems crazy, but before you could work for anybody and not have to tell the department you had a second job and that you couldn't work for the Chinese or the Russians uh, at all through any of their talent programs. And um, and uh, and so we we put that out and we we told everyone, uh, if you want to work for the Chinese, you either have to quit working at Los Alamos or uh, you have to stop working for the Chinese. Uh, and I know this seems horribly obvious, but it wasn't happening when we showed up. Um, and, you know, and we ultimately, through a series of things, you know, our our last order. And by the way, when we left it, we did not leave it perfect. I knew the Chinese were still stealing stuff, and that we every week where we we're going to find something new, and we needed to keep working at it. So I have a little bit of you know, when I look at an administration, I just. All I would say is you should own, you should know that you have a problem. You should own that you have the problem. You shouldn't be defensive about it or else you're going to protect the problem. And you should try to address it as well as possible. That's how I look at these things, which is just just own it. Like the problem isn't us. The problem, from my point of view, the problem isn't ours versus, you know, D's. It's about the China's a problem, right? And if, if we focus that they're the problem, and as long as everyone's trying their hardest to try to do something, I think that's the best way to approach it. Yeah, well, I agree. Um, and and obviously, but going back to the aircraft that we've been shooting. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna I've let lived you this for too me. long. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it was good, and I and I did forget to bring up some of your all's work, and I meant to bring that up earlier. Was some of y'all's yeah. work on on uncovering Chinese espionage. It, it is a major problem. It's a difficult problem. Uh, because what they do is they infiltrate the the universities, they infiltrate our research facilities, and and there's one of two options there. It's either infiltrated with a with a card carrying member of the CCP, or I think the more likely scenario is infiltrated by a certainly a, a well meaning smart Chinese person who then gets threatened or recruited by the CCP after the fact. So that, that, to me, yeah. that's the more likely scenario. Um, just operationally speaking, and it's a very difficult problem because they're everywhere, uh, yeah. and they're and they're good at STEM and they're, they're good at they're, they're We, and, and that's, it's a difficult problem too, because on the one hand, you want them, you want them here uh, doing the, the research for us, but we want to make sure we're keeping it. And that, 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 that's um, that it's not escaping uh, back to Chinese hands. So, uh, yeah. but so, okay. So let's just lay out these, <laughs> these crazy well, so, phenomenon thing. Yeah. The first thing, you know what it was, it was this ridiculous Chinese spy balloon. Yeah. Um, what they're going to collect, I mean, that's a whole other conversation, what what they can possibly collect with a balloon they don't already, have, don't already get from satellite imagery. Uh, that's an ongoing question. I think will we'll hopefully be soon answered based on uh, the recovery effort on, on the tech on board. Um, I, 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 think it, I think there's a story here of Chinese ineptitude that's not being talked about in the press. It's all about, and I get it, right? We got to own Biden. Sure, fine. But um People people tend to forget that the Chinese are inept uh, in many. It's why they have to steal so much stuff from us. Uh, they're they're not always inept, but sometimes they can be very inept. And uh, the left hand not talking to the right hand, uh, and 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 frankly, just coming up with silly, foolish ideas that only a, a crazy authoritarian bureaucracy could come up with. Um, yeah. So th- there's 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 a, there's a bunch of possibilities. But I think it's strange, and again, this is uh, I, I feel like you're that you're an interesting guy to talk to about this, given your background in technology and cutting edge uh, you know, frontiers of innovation and all that. So, but then there's three there's three other shoot downs that we've had, and we have no idea what these particular objects are. Uh, the DoD has pretty much said that they're not balloons uh, at this point; that they actually don't know how they stay afloat. Whatever it is, they're not sure what kind of propulsion system it is. 
uh, or if it's a, a different type of balloon, but it's not like what they saw before. We know they don't have defense mechanisms on them. Like you're okay. We all saw a top gun, right? They, they throw out the chaff every time they they get a missile shot at them. They clearly don't have that because apparently they're easy to shoot down. Um, they don't appear to maneuver very well, uh, to escape an F-22. So what the heck are these things? What could they possibly be? And are they just over our airspace all the time? And we just started angling our radars and our sensors at that particular altitude to look for them. I don't know. Do you have any answers to any of those questions? Yeah, I, uh, I'm not as familiar with Arctic balloons, uh, but I am familiar with Antarctic balloons. <laughs> and so uh, down da- down at McMurdo Station in Antarctica, the U.S. throws up balloons, science balloons all the time uh, to do weather measurements around Antarctica. They throw up balloons. We put telescopes actually up in balloons. It's like the low cost version rather than web of like shooting it up into space. Uh, we, 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 we have small sized, you know, medium sized telescopes and we put them up in balloons and we, uh, throw them up over the Antarctic because it's, it's better atmosphere from where it is, uh, for, for, for telescope shots of the universe. So there's lots of different things that you can just science applications for balloons. The one thing that triggered me on the confirmed Chinese one was the size because, of all the ones that I was familiar with, it was doing some pretty, you know, technical things, right? So like telescopes in the universe, um, they weren't anywhere near the size of that Chinese balloon. Hmm. Um, that that's the one thing that uh that that stood out for me. Yeah, and you gotta wonder what yeah, you know, why was it? It was the three school buses worth of debris, which helps you understand why they didn't want to shoot it down um over over really the continental US at all. I, I I do understand that. Um, it was it was rather large. I guess I guess we'll find out more. And uh, okay, I'm, so I'm not going to get you to do some rank speculation on the other three. <laughs> I, I think the most damage. important thing about China is deterrence and piercing the veil of optimism. Optimism leads to war, and uh, Putin clearly thought he could invade Ukraine because he was optimistic he was going to win. He mm-hmm. thought Germany was not going to, you know, they thought the U.S. was not going to step in because of what happened in Afghanistan. Germany was not going to step in because of energy dependence, you know, whatever. And optimism that the Ukraine military wouldn't stand up. Um, uh, if if the, the 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 likely trigger of a war with China is their optimism that they can pull something off, and mm-hmm. uh, so I I think we need to pierce their view of optimism. And that's that's with with strong deterrence and, and action. Yeah, well, I would agree with that. And uh, peace through strength actually has to mean something. It, like Reagan has a quote out there said he's lived through four wars in his lifetime, and none of those wars started because America was too strong. You know, and 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 if, speaking of our own political side, lately, uh, especially lately, they like to say peace through strength, but they definitely forget about the strength part. The strength part is is hard. You got to have some balls, and you you got to be willing to 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 saber rattle a little strategically, of course. But you, you've got to be willing to stand up, and um, you can always have peace by giving up. And I and I, I fear that's what the right wing populists want now more than ever. The left wing has always wanted that, it seems, uh, at least the progressive far left. And um, it concerns me that there's now a a, a kind of a coherent philosophy emerging between the far left and the far right on this particular subject of foreign policy. And um, it, it, it's worrisome. It, it's it's I'm more optimistic on the issue of China just because it, people seem to to agree that they're a bad belligerent actor. Why why people disagree about that as it pertains to Russia is perplexing to me. Um, but indeed, they, they they seem to view these through two different lenses for some reason. Um, but yeah, it would, it would seem to me that getting the right technology and weapon systems to Taiwan, um, as soon as possible, uh, should be a priority. And it it doesn't seem to be, um, from this administration that, that concerns everybody. I think I wrote a paper at Columbia on the weakness of China on imported energy. And, uh, they are massively exposed to imported oil and gas, Mm -hmm. um, they 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 produce very small percentages something like 25 percent of their oils domestically produced 
Yeah. And most of it comes by sea. Um, uh, and uh, I think we should be thinking about energy in China offensively. Yeah. Um, uh, because uh, a relatively easy embargo uh, would uh, significantly hurt the country if they decide to do something. Yeah, I mean, I, I even even with our incompetence, uh, it, I, I'm pretty bullish on America. Just we're lucky for a lot of reasons. We have mass amounts of resources. To, uh, we have friendly neighbors to the north and and to the south. I mean, if we can get, if we can do some of these cartels anyway, uh, but for the most part, we, we have no fear of invasion. We have uh, access to both large oceans and. And in a, in a healthy demography to an aging population, sure, but it can it, it can stabilize if we're smart about it. Uh, the Chinese are screwed on on many many accounts. Uh, access to resources, which of course they've they've tried to fix through their Belt and Road Initiative and cornering the market on on especially processing raw materials to to get what you know to get whatever nice thing that you want in your iPhone. Um, you, you generally processed in China. And we could do it here if our environmentalists would let us. This, this isn't this is a, none of this is impossible to overcome. But I think their their demographics are really really bad. The the worst in the world, and it's it's not talked about enough. And and I don't care that it's not talked about enough. I don't want people to start whistling past the graveyard and and and, and get lackadaisical and, and complacent on China. Uh, but they're gonna. The, 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 they're going to have massive problems, and I think pretty quickly here in the next ten years or so, just because of their aging population. I mean, the the merging of innovation and technology and China policy. I wrote about this in the Wall Street Journal last year. Is that the reason why we're so successful? In part, is because uh, because of our innovation. And an important requirement of innovation is freedom. And uh, you need to have freedom of thought. Freedom of thought allows you to freedom of action and freedom of ideas, freedom to raise money from all sorts of different sources who, you know, cover your idea, not the command and control central entity that picks and chooses winners, which, you know, many times fails on who they pick and choose. And, uh, you know, I think both left and right, I think freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of action um, you know, that cuts across the right and the left, right? Some people on the left look at freedom uh, in terms of ability to do whatever they want, right? In terms of how they think about things. And I think on, on the right, you know, people are also all for freedom. I think that's a real, a real strength of America and, and vis-a-vis, uh, on, you know, narrowly on the technology and innovation topic that we will, uh, at least on that narrow topic, uh, you know, we're, I think we'll always be a leader. I think so, too. And it's an optimistic place to, to end the conversation. Appreciate your time, Paul. Thank you. And thanks okay. for what you uh, did for our country, uh, both in the Navy and uh, the Department of Energy. And uh, excited to, to see what you guys come up with at, uh, at, at, uh, in Bohr Quantum Computing. It's, uh, okay, well, and, and thank you for your historical and, and ongoing service, sir.